Luke 7, verse 36, the Bible says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? <laughs> Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore, I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. This morning as we work our way through this story in Scripture, I want us to consider His forgiveness. Consider His forgiveness. Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer and ask the Lord's blessing on this time. Lord, we come to You asking You to remove any distractions or things that may uh, come up during this time. Help us to focus in for the next few moments, Lord, on this passage, on what You want to speak to us about. Lord, we didn't come here out of routine. We didn't come here out of obligation or duty. We came here because we want to make much of you, learn of you, draw closer to you, be more like you. Help us to do so during this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text today shows us the truth of our memory verse. Our memory verse this week talks about sin abounding. And yet... The same time that sin is abounding, grace much more abounds. This passage tells us of a woman who was deemed a sinner by society. Her reputation was far from godly, and yet God's grace changes her life. During this time as Jesus is traveling and, and performing miracles and preaching, he's in a region and a Pharisee, named Simon, invites Jesus to his house. The fact that Simon was a Pharisee tells us a lot about Simon. It tells us that he was someone who knew the law. It tells us that he was someone who had memorized hundreds of passages of Scripture. It tells us that he understood rules that perhaps weren't even in the Bible. He was a man of religious pedigree, high up there in religion, to say the least. Now, we don't know exactly why he invited Jesus to his house. We can speculate. Perhaps he was trying to find fault with Jesus. They, the, the Pharisees saw Jesus. They saw him as a great teacher, but they didn't believe he was the Messiah. Maybe he was trying to find fault with him. Perhaps he selfishly invited him because Jesus was becoming popular in the day. Perhaps he was interested in Jesus' teaching and wanted to know more. We don't know exactly why, but we do know that he invited him to be a guest at his house. As we look at the story, one thing pops out in my mind as I read through it. 
I don't know about you, I try to put myself in that scripture when I read it. I see that Simon invites Jesus to his house and a woman shows up. Random. Ever had that happen? Yeah. You invite someone to your house for supper and someone else shows up? I've... I personally have never had that. Maybe you have a neighborhood kid that shows up all the time regardless. and maybe, So maybe that, that is how it goes. But this wasn't another adult. We've got to understand, though, in this culture at this time, uh, a, a dinner guest was far from a private affair. The invited guest would, would lie on cushions around the table, but the host would set out other cushions for passerbys, passerbyers, however you say that. That they, they would allow guests or, or visitors to come by and converse with the guest. They wouldn't necessarily stay and eat and enjoy the whole time, but they could pass by and join in on the conversation. And during this visit, something incredible happens. As Jesus is having dinner with Simon, a woman shows up. And I want us to see three truths from this passage. First of all, I want us to see the sacrificial act. During dinner, a woman comes to give a sacrificial gift to Jesus. It says in verse 37 of our text, Behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, stood at his feet behind him, weeping, began to wash his feet with her tears, did wipe them with the hairs of her head, kissed his feet, anointed them with the ointment. A sacrificial act. The sacrifice that this woman gives was something that's very valuable to her. I want us to consider for a moment what a sacrifice is. For this woman. You see the Bible doesn't give us much about this woman. It doesn't tell us her name. It doesn't give us her family. It doesn't list her pedigree. All we know about her is really two things. She came from a city. And she was a sinner. Now yes. The Bible says that we're all sinners. But the Bible specifically makes a particular point to say that this woman was a sinner. And the word that's used here uh, describing her really means devoted to sin. Not free from sin. Someone who is controlled by sin. You can fill in the blank what you think that may mean for her in this day, but it wasn't good. She had a bad reputation in this city. Also in this particular time in history and culture, a Jewish rabbi would never speak to a woman. Much less a woman known for being controlled by sin. And yet here in this story, you have a woman, bad reputation, controlled by sin, and a Jewish rabbi, the master, Jesus himself, not condemning her. Not telling her to leave. Perhaps as she approached, I, I imagine she was probably fearful that she wouldn't be accepted. And yet she still came. What she did revealed a deep humility on her part. She knew she had a bad reputation, and yet she had a heart of humility. Notice as she comes into Jesus' presence what it says in verse 38. And stood at his feet behind him. You catch that? As she comes in with Jesus, she didn't try to command his attention. Jesus, I'm here to seek you. It's not what she did. Perhaps she felt unworthy of such an honor. She didn't demand that Jesus listen to her. I've got something to say. I come to give my request to you. That's not what she did. She simply kneels down at his feet and begins to wash his feet with her tears. I think it's safe to say something's going on in this woman's heart and life at this time. I believe it's safe to say she was fully aware of who Jesus was. She desperately wanted to be in his presence, was willing to humble herself. That's sacrifice. 
a sacrifice defined, but I want us to see, second of all, a sacrifice demonstrated. Catch this, please. This woman demonstrated her sacrifice with her actions. I believe there are many Christians today, even church-going Christians, who can talk about Christ and tell you much about the Bible, and yet they don't pour out their lives in service to Him. No doubt Simon here in this passage, the Pharisee, perhaps could have given a speech for an hour about all the good and the evil that he understood from all his studies. But this woman didn't say a word. Instead, she demonstrated her sacrifice by her actions. It's very clear. We all know the saying that actions speak louder than words. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. By washing Jesus' feet with her hair, by anointing his feet with her ointment, she showed how much she valued Jesus and wanted him. We don't have to wonder what she thought about Jesus. We know as soon as she's washing his feet, instantly we know that she highly valued being in his presence. Reminder, this woman was one who was hated and disrespected by society. As I look at this woman and what the Bible tells us about this woman, I believe she had one little aspect of glory remaining. You see, in this culture, in the first century, a woman's hair was her glory. 1 Corinthians 11.15 tells us that specifically. It was sometimes used as a gift. It was sometimes used as a gift to her husband in this culture, in this century. And she's got one aspect of glory left, her hair. And she uses that to wash his feet. Perhaps she only had one valuable possession left to her name, this ointment. And she uses that to wash his feet. So with a heart of love, this woman comes to Jesus, offering the only two things of worth that she possessed, her ointment and her hair. Lord, I give you the little glory that I have. That's not what her words said. That's what her actions say. With an attitude of humility, it tells us that she's weeping as she does this. We don't know what brought her to this state. Maybe it was just the very fact of being in God's presence recognizing what grace is all about. Maybe they were tears of joy. We don't know. We do know a few things, though. Because of the harmony of Scripture and of the Gospels, we know something that happened shortly before this event. Matthew tells us about it. In Matthew 11, you'll recognize these verses. Jesus had just gotten done preaching a message, and at the end of it, he says this, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. You shall find rest to your souls, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You know, it's very possible this woman heard that message and followed Jesus as he next went to Simon's house. She could have heard this man named Jesus speak, the, the same one who John the Baptist said, This is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Maybe she saw her hope for her burden that undoubtedly weighed her down, her sin, that controlled her life. Maybe she saw, wait a minute, there's hope now. I can't escape where I find my, the situation I find myself in. Everywhere I go, it follows me. I've gotten, I'm controlled by the power of sin. And he says, come to me. That's what I want. That's my only hope. Perhaps that's what she's thinking. Maybe that's why she's crying as she put the ointment on Jesus, knowing that he was the one that could lift her burdens. We see her in a humble, repentant state, pouring out her love at Jesus' feet as a sacrificial act. I want us to see, second of all, not just a sacrificial act, but a sarcastic assessment. There's a sarcastic assessment made. God looks at the heart but man 
What's on the outside, the Bible tells us. When this Pharisee sees what this woman was doing, he immediately judges the outside and makes a proud assessment. Look in verse 39. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, what did he see? He saw the woman humbly behind Jesus, not seeking attention, wiping, washing his feet with her tears, with her hair, anointing his feet. What does the Pharisee see? He spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. I want us to see in this assessment, first of all, it was directed toward the Savior. The first thing this religious person does would say, this man, if he were a prophet. You see, a Pharisee was someone in that time who was always trying to find fault with Jesus. We see it in Luke 15. We see it in, in Luke 5 and Luke 19. The truth of the matter is this. Jesus never hid the reason he came to earth. He came to save sinners from the bondage of sin. Watch this. He never made apology for going to the common people and preaching the gospel. We see it. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Bible says the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And yet it seems as though every time Jesus tried to help someone in sin, the scribes and the Pharisees criticize him. We've got to be careful, though, instead of pointing fingers there, that we take inventory in our own lives that we don't have the same attitude. When we look at someone and rather in judgment thinking they're awful. Look at the mess they've made of their lives. Seeing they need Jesus and His forgiveness. If you've ever been saved for a long period of time there's a danger of forgetting how desperately we needed God's grace in our lives. And so because of that, we may look down on someone else. Consider, for instance, guests who may come to this church, perhaps carrying a similar burden of sin as this woman did. The last thing a, a guest would need in coming to church as a Christian, watch this, casting judgment on how they look at them and how they act around them. Instead, a person needs a sense of the wonderful grace of Jesus. But Simon here was bold in his criticism. Dismissing Christ's response to the woman. The, the same way that Satan has all the way back uh, in the very beginning of time in Genesis 3, questioning God and God's word. But Simon's assessment didn't stop with Jesus. He moves on to the woman. First, his assessment's towards the Savior, and then it's towards the sinner, towards the woman. You see, when Simon looked at her, he never saw hope. The hope that Jesus gives. All he saw was a woman trapped in the chains of sin. He didn't have the grace-filled vision to see the change that could happen in someone's life. Watch this this morning. Grace always has a vision for hope and change. The Pharisee only had his biased attitude. In fact, James 2 tells us this. Perhaps you'll recognize these verses. For if they're coming to your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and they're coming also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? The Bible gives us a very clear illustration and explanation saying if people come into you, to your church or to the house of God dressed nicely, well-groomed, be glad that they're there. But if someone else, perhaps less fortunate, comes in, we should be just as glad to have and to see them. Why? Well, the ground's level at the 
foot of the cross. Everyone matters to God. But in this Pharisee's sarcastic attitude, he didn't understand the love of Christ. He doesn't understand that therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Jesus hears this rebuke aimed at himself and at the heart of this humble woman. We see the sacrificial act and the sarcastic assessment, but I want us to end with this, the spiritual answer that's given. He observed everything going on around him. Perhaps there was an awkward moment of silence. As Jesus is here, again, put yourself in the story. There's a woman that everybody knows is a wicked woman. She's still crying. She's anointing his feet. We've got the owner of the house, the one who's kind of in charge of this whole affair and casting judgment on her. And then Jesus breaks the silence. And he gives a spiritual answer in the form of a parable. Verse 40. Verse 41. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? He tells Simon a parable. And the parable had three simple thoughts. First was the debt of finance. I believe that's something we all can relate to. Perhaps that's why Jesus gives this parable. He knows people will understand. Whether or not you're personally in debt, you can't turn on the news for longer than a few minutes and you'll hear a story about the national debt and the effects that it brings to our economy. So in this parable, two people were in debt. It says pence. A pence was about a day's wage. One, hundred, one, one man was 500 pence in debt to this guy. That's about two years worth of work in debt to this man. The other owed 50 pence. That's about two weeks worth of debt. One owed two weeks worth of debt to this creditor. One owed two years worth of debt to this creditor. They both feel the bondage of debt. Undoubtedly, though, one man felt a much greater burden than the other. And yet the creditor choose to forgive them both. So we see the debt of finance and then we see the gift of forgiveness. When forgiveness happens, watch this. Anytime forgiveness happens, it's a gift. And those who have experienced much forgiveness oftentimes appreciate and understand it for, what the gift, for the gift that it is. Think about this woman. As she washed the feet of Jesus, she probably felt much thankfulness for his forgiveness. She had been forgiven of a large debt. She was truly grateful. And what's amazing, do you ever see Jesus telling this woman how to serve him because of it? She simply did it for one reason. And it's the third principle in this. We see the debt of finance and the gift of forgiveness, but then we see the debt of love. The last part of verse 42, Jesus says, tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? The one who was forgiven more, obviously loved more. What once was a debt of money, watch this, now is a debt of love. When we recognize how great the sin of which we have been forgiven, our response should be one of love. And help us this morning. Our desire to serve the Lord should never be out of duty. If our desire, watch this, if our desire to serve God and to live for Him is because that's what we have to do, not going to last. Furthermore, if our desire is because it's out of fear of upsetting God, never last. If our, our desire to serve the Lord as we consider all that He's done for Him and, and now we've got to earn His favor, not going to last. And it'll be superficial at best. What we learn here in this principle and this parable and this passage is that our desire to serve the Lord should be out of love. 
Just stopping to consider all that Christ has done for us, all that Christ did to save us, all that Christ has forgiven us of, should motivate us to want to serve Him. This woman knew she was a sinner, knew that the Lord had forgiven her of so many sins, didn't have to be told once, much less twice, and wanted to love Him. Never let your motivation for service, for, for actively loving and serving God, never let, that, never let that motivation be the chains of bondage and fear of not pleasing Him. I encourage you with this. You don't have to do anything to earn the acceptance of God. Look right here. God loves you as you are, who you are right now. And you can't do anything to make him love you more. And you also can't do anything to make him love you less. We don't understand that oftentimes as, as people because... We, we, we love someone based on what they've done and if they've earned their trust. But God says, I love you unconditionally. Nothing you can do will earn my favor more or earn it less. God loves you. And when we come to a point in our life when we realize that God brought us out of our sinful state, freed us from the chains of sin and of bondage, our life changes. Now we serve God, not because we have to, but because we want to. Because we love Him. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. You know what that word constrain means? It means to hold together. What holds my life together? The fact that God loves me. I can keep going because of that. I don't have to go because the preacher said I got to do this and I got to follow this and I got to live this way and I got no 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 I'm not doing it because I'm fearing God won't God God won't show me favor if I no 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 I'm doing that because God loves me and I just want to love Him. That's why we serve the Lord. What greater way? Is there to live our lives than to forever say thank you for the one who gives us hope? And then he applies this parable. He applies this parable in the last few verses of our text. You see, Jesus didn't forgive this woman simply because she had the most sin. He forgave her because she repented. She needed forgiveness. Watch this. And she recognized her need for forgiveness. She recognized her condition of sin and recognized her need of a savior and repented of her sin. Sinners can't receive forgiveness until they acknowledge their need for it. Notice how the events unfold as we finish this passage. Verse 44. He turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? Let's stop right there for a moment. Jesus looks at the Pharisee he says, you see her? Simon thought he had seen her. And he misjudged that situation completely. And Jesus says, get a good look. Because you've missed it altogether. You thought I missed it? You're the one that's missed it, big boy. Seest thou this woman? I entered thy house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. By the way, that was a common courtesy of the day. He missed it. She hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. Should have been done as they came in. Common courtesy of culture of the day. But this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. Something he should have done as the, as the host. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. He says, Simon, you've missed it, buddy. In your whole idea of having the outside right and proper and making sure everything, every I is dotted and every T is crossed in your life and, and making sure that everybody sees that you've got it all together, you missed the important part. And while you're casting judgment on this woman who's a sinner, let me tell you something. She's got it. She's humble in her heart. 
No, she doesn't have it all together on the outside, but her heart is one of humility and she sees her need for forgiveness. And because of that, I forgive you. Your sins are forgiven. Simon shows no humility. The sinner shows great humility. Jesus forgives the repentant. Jesus forgives those who trust in Him. The truth of the matter is, verse 48, He said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Verse 50, And He said to the woman, Here it is, Thy faith hath saved thee. Thy faith has saved thee. She trusted who Jesus is and what he offered. And Jesus saved her for that. Divine forgiveness is based upon faith. Here was a woman with repentance and faith toward Christ saved from her sins. I want you to catch the last phrase, the last three words in this chapter. He says, verse 50, Thy faith has saved thee. Notice, go in peace. Wow. How did she come in? Undoubtedly, she came in with a heavy burden. Undoubtedly, she came in with fear, wondering if I'm going to be accepted, knowing what my reputation and, and society thinks of me. And, and yet there's Jesus. And I know he said, come unto me and I, I'll give you rest. And I, I've got a burden. And he says to take his yoke and, and I, I want that. And I'm not going to clamor for his attention. I don't even know if he'll notice me, but I can wash his feet with my tears. I can wash him with my hair. I can, I can give him the little glory I have with this, with this ointment. And then he looks at her and says, My sins are forgiven thee. Go in peace. He changes her life. Because she came to him humbly and gave him everything she had and put her faith in him, God removes her burden. And she leaves a different woman. Did she still have a reputation? Undoubtedly. Perhaps that took a long time to change. But that's not the point of the story. The point is, she came in burdened and she left free. She came in full of sorrow and sin and she left in peace. Because of Jesus' forgiveness. As we conclude this morning, may I encourage you with a few concluding thoughts. Let's not be as the Pharisee. Let's not look on society and people that pass by today and people that we see perhaps often and think, ugh, Pharisee. Instead, may we see through grace-filled eyes of the hope for change when they meet Jesus. Perhaps that's something that can spur us on to hand them a gospel track. Perhaps that can be our motivation to say, hey, I want you to come to church with me this week. Can I get your number? I'll give you a call and remind you. You need a ride? Let me pick you up. Why? Jesus wants to give you hope. Jesus can change your life. May I encourage you also, never lose sight of what Jesus did to save you. You say, Pastor, I wasn't in a life filled with sin. Perhaps that's the case. The truth of the matter is all our hearts are in the same condition. Black with sin. And we were all destined for hell. It doesn't matter what was on the outside. The inside we were filled with sin. And Jesus forgave you. If you've trusted him this morning. In every life where sin abounds. Grace can more abundantly abound. As we consider the forgiveness of Jesus. May we remember the reason why we do what we do. Not to gain God's acceptance. Not to gain God's love. Our motivation to serve Him should be out of love and joy. Not fear and duty. And then finally, as we consider His forgiveness. Again, remember where we were before He saved us. Carrying a sin burden. 
bound and controlled by this burden. Slaves of sin, but Jesus said, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Because of that, you and I are no longer under the power of sin if you trusted Christ. You are no longer enslaved and bond and, and chains of bondage to that sin. You don't say, Pastor, I've got no control over it. Jesus said, I've already forgiven you for it. I've given you, I've broken the power of sin. We're still in the presence of sin, but it doesn't have to control us. Ask Jesus for his forgiveness. Ask Jesus for his strength, and he can help you through. Consider his forgiveness. Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer this morning. Thank you for listening.